so far, we've been in one dimension. And we got incredible amount of stuff from basically nothing, because in one dimension, you can either run or stop. Or uh, if you change, you know, the forcing of the system, you can go through bifurcations. Or you can run on a circle, so you get an oscillation, but that was about it. And now the whole new part of the course starts, which is we will move to two dimensions. For most people who do research that's related to nonlinear sciences, two dimensions are incredibly boring as well, because it's not that much more you can do. It's only when you get to three dimensions, you get chaos and turbulence, which are you know modern, exciting things. But there's still a lot to learn. And we'll move to two dimensions today, but we'll only do it for linear systems, which are very simple. And even there, we learn quite a bit. And the reason why I'm pulling out my drawing at all, you know, most people uh, who do engineering, chemistry, physics, biophysics, uh, genomics, neuroscience, turbulence, whatever, quantum field theory, face very nonlinear problems. And you know, they need our methods, but they have to be strongly nonlinear in the problems. Now, why is linear important? So even when you have a nonlinear problem, which here is indicated by some kind of landscape, which is every place curvy but smooth, Locally, the world looks flat. And that's actually quite powerful concept. So we will use it today. We'll assume flat Earth from here to infinity. And whatever I do, the most of response I will get be proportional to what I do. That's called linear theory. You know, I push something, it pushes me back proportional to uh, pushing that I have caused. So these are linear systems. You have two dimensions and two dimensions. So there are two variables, not one. So in two dimensions, we're again looking at dynamical systems that can be described by ordinary differential equations, in particular differential equations in time, rate of change of these two variables, or velocity in abstract state space. And let's assume that my velocity is proportional to A with some number here, a rate. But it also cares about the other variable, B1. And my other variable, Y, is responds to you know, where I am in my direction X and it responds to itself. And this D is just a constant, it's not a differential. And when you say linear systems, you could put some constants here, but we typically change coordinates in such a way that uh, it's centered uh, at origin our linear system. So there are no extra terms. And those systems, you naturally write in vector and matrix notation by putting your velocity in a vector by thinking of your state, state position, two-dimensional state position as a two-dimensional vector. And the relation between your velocity and where you are is given by this matrix, A, B, C, D. So that's a linear system. Or you could write it as vector x. So two component vector is uh, proportional to vector x. This is time change of vector x times the matrix A. So compactly we'll write in matrix notations. Now what's good about being linear? It has a magical property which lots of physicists who have only learned quantum mechanics and nothing else take for granted, but it's a big deal. 
And the property is that if you have a solution, so there is an equation, you try to solve it. I'll show you how to solve it. So if you have a, two solutions, meaning two vectors, x1 as a function of time, I solve that problem. I know where I am at any given time. So if I have these solutions, then their combination, any linear combination, meaning I take the first guy, x1, implicitly a function of time, multiply by any number, c, and I take the second guy, and multiply by any number c, then this is also a solution. Now, in real life, this is never true. So, for example, uh, people who do climate prediction the way they do climate prediction is there are about, let's say, 20 supercomputer centers and national institutes around the globe. And they put their best intellectual effort in constructing a very high dimensional vector, you know, not that's two dimensional, but maybe million dimensional, which is supposed to be state of a climate. And then they have equations which are much more complicated than this. They have lots of nonlinear terms. And they run possible outcomes for the climate on different computers. And then they get together. And one thing that you absolutely should not do, but they have done it, <laughs> you should not take a Dutch simulation and German simulation and, uh, you know, Boulder, Colorado simulation of climate model, put them together by multiplying them by some numbers and say, well, this is the prediction uh, for the weather because nonlinear problems don't have this property. One solution and other solution cannot be related in any simple way by you know adding them up or any such thing. That doesn't happen. So if people do this in real life, it's criminal. But uh, it is wonderful when it happens. So an example where it happens where you don't think it should happen is when people study motor control in primate brains, then uh, you know they can give some stimuli to, let's say, a monkey and look at how the response is, muscular response, which way the monkey hand moves. And it turns out that uh, if you give some of different stimuli, uh, the monkey will respond in a linear way much more than you would expect. So, you know, it's an empirical thing when linear approximations are good. Sometimes they're good in a very surprising place. Uh, so, linear systems have a magical solution that if you know several solutions, then you maybe know all the possible solutions just by adding them. That's totally amazing. And the way that this system is designed, linear system, it has only one fixed point, which in this particular case is at zero, because if I set all x's and y's to zero, then velocity is a zero, but it could be someplace else. So this is, but linear uh, system can have only one fixed point. So the first thing we told you, go and find fixed points, it uh, doesn't get you very much because um, the system has only one. For purposes of this course, you know, we just look at linear system. And it's, we think of it mostly in a flat Earth approximation. If we have a sufficiently small neighborhood uh, in an otherwise complicated world, 
it's a good approximation. And in practice, you have to balance the linear versus small nonlinear terms to decide at what point it breaks down. So there are this, you know, there are methods for doing that. It turns out that understanding linear systems is incredibly useful beyond the wildest things. So here is an example of a system that you maybe don't realize is linear. So if I hang you know, from the ceiling on a steel spring, a ball of certain mass, I, I can find so-called equilibrium position in which if I release the ball, nothing happens. You know, the, it's gravitational forcing exactly equals the sp spring response and you are in equilibrium. So then it's natural to choose that point as the origin of your coordinates. And we assume that only motion you will have is one dimensional vertical motion. So the X will measure deviations of the you know, equilibrium position for the system. The equation comes all the way back from Hooke's was stolen by Newton. No, actually, gravitation was stolen by Newton, also from Hooke. And it says Newton law, mass time acceleration equals plus the opposing force, which is the force of the spring. And that force cares about the displacement. You know, if you're at equilibrium, you feel no force, but if you pull harder and harder, uh, you experience, you know, more and more pullback or pushback. And that's characterized by a spring constant K and the equation is zero. Now, we told you whenever you have equation hard and first order, go to the state space where all terms, equations are first order. You know, how do you do this? You decide to call first derivative, you decide to call it velocity. Then the second derivative, you have equation for second, first derivative of loss, second derivative of position, that means change of velocity is acceleration. You know, divide by n, and you find out that the velocity is proportional to the displacement, and it has this property, there's a minus sign, so if I push this way, the system will try to move in the opposite direction, and velocity is high if the spring is very stiff, velocity is low if this is a huge weight, <coughs> so this ratio shows up here. And engineers and myself like to think of all possible allowed values of X and V as all allowed states of the system. And then uh, if you can define a vector field of velocity, you know, if you're given state, where are you going to move this time? This is this uh, vector field here. That's the law that tells you how you explore your state space. Now, in this case, there is another name for this, which is what physicists always use. It's called phase plane. And you'll see pretty soon why is, you know, right now there are no angles or anything, but pretty soon you'll see that phases, meaning angles uh, of waves or oscillations make sense. And the idea of phase space is that you draw velocity 
an X. So this is a plane that to all these guys. The origin is our fixed point where if both velocity and position are at the origin and they're zero, then nothing will happen because rates of change are going to zero. So that's a fixed point. Velocity. And then it's position. And now it's very easy to draw this vector field. So if uh, velocity is zero, you know, so if I'm on this line, velocity, no, I'm sorry, on X line, velocity zero, then there is, um, no x component to my velocity vector, there's only v component. And, you know, if x is positive, that points down at every value of x. Uh, minus because it had to do with opposing forces here. And its magnitude is this constant k over m. Now this constant shows up all the time so people have a different interpretation of it. They call it omega square, which will turn out to be a frequency. And you know, that's the only parameter of this equation because stiffness and the mass of the particle on a string shows up here. Now, if I'm on this side, X is negative, so this thing is pointing up. Now, let's look at X equals zero. Then I only have a horizontal velocity component, and it's simply proportional in this case to uh, how high I'm up, so it's small here, gets longer and longer as a velocity field. And then if you're someplace on the lower end, it's going this way. So it's very easy to draw dynamics in the phase plane for harmonic oscillator. Space, velocity. Uh, and you can see that these guys, we just plotted them. You know, everybody is leaving here going up, going down. So this is looking clockwise. So on the axis, it's obvious. <laughs> but now if you start plotting other points, <coughs> you will find out that they point this way. And you can see that you're getting some kind of circulating field. And indeed, a surprising thing happens, which shouldn't be, you know, it doesn't happen always, but it happens in this case. That, remember what the integration of our trajectory was? It was integrating this velocity and, and continuing in direction at a given time. So trajectory will move, bend, 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 and cross at this angle. And if you do this integration, you will discover <coughs> that you run around 
and you come back exactly where you started. And when you look at your equation, MX, this one, you will discover that actually uh, every one of these orbits satisfies that omega square x square plus b square velocity is constant on that orbit. That's a definition of ellipse. So it turns out harmonic oscillator, when you look at it in the, you know, your space, it's just going up and down and you happen to know it's a good clock. It's one way of making clocks. But when you look at it in a phase space, it's very pretty because what it does is uh, where you start here depends of, you know, how much I pulled it to initiate the motion or how much I pushed it, kicked it to give it some velocity. But once it has it, it just run on ellipse and it closes in itself. So this is an example of periodic or closed. And then you look at it and you see some, you know, nice obvious stuff. So for example, when I'm as far as possible above my equilibrium position for given energy or below my equilibrium position, that's exactly a point in which my velocity is turning from going down to going up when I look at the oscillating thing. And these are these points here. So there are turning points in which uh, as you change direction of your motion, you have uh, extremal potential energy, extremal stretch, and minimal uh, zero kinetic energy. So extrema in space, correspond to no motion, just uh, no kinetic energy, only you know, all the energies in the string. Similarly, when you start up here, you shoot through x equals zero, and then you start slowing down. So at x equals zero, you have most kinetic energy. And that you can see here, that's extremal point as well. So here you have extremal velocity. Now, that this orbit should be closed is far from obvious, but you'll realize pretty soon in two dimensions, it's a little bit more interesting than three dimensions, but determinism doesn't allow you to come to the same point in state space from different uh, velocities and different position, because at that point you will have two distinct paths or two distinct futures and the determinism doesn't allow that. You know, every orbit uh, is unique and uh, has unique past and future, which forces the layers of uh, trajectories here to look like a strudel or you know layer cake or something rolled up uh, because nobody is supposed to cross. So if you have oscillatory motion in two dimensions, they have to do something like this. But the other thing that can happen, which we'll see very soon, you know, suppose that this guy was in honey. So I yeah, pull it, you know. It goes back, it slows down, and very soon it dies, and you get a spiraling motion. So this is not necessarily what you get. This is a magical thing about classical mechanics or energy conservation. 
that you get periodic motion. So don't take it for granted. Now, to get a little bit more intuition about the system, you know, this system, if you thought about as a matrix, you know, this was X was proportional to V, so that's off diagonal term of the matrix, and this was minus X, so that's off diagonal, that's a little bit weird. But that's the essence of mechanics. Essence of mechanics is that if I push this way, mechanical system phase space will turn sideways so it doesn't uh, lose energy. The way this equation is written, you know, there is a minus sign here. And that uh, gives us clockwise rotation. So, you know, you're asking me serious questions, so I'll also give you a serious answer. You would say, well, well what happens if I say X is minus X? You know, I just decide to label my X differently. Shouldn't it go the other way? Uh, but what happens is that, um, you know, the sign changes both in acceleration or velocity and position. So if you do that, it'll turn out uh, you will still get the same clockwise rotation. So even though the system doesn't know left from right, it does know clockwise from anti-clockwise. Uh, then you say, well, you know, I have a clock and I don't know what's past or future. It all looks the same to me. So what happens if I change direction, you know, of uh, time? then velocity would change sign, right? Because now I'm running backwards in time. Well, because this equation has two derivatives in time, uh, it still doesn't change the result. So it, it's really always uh, clockwise. So now, you know, so this is a little bit weird as uh, we are looking at linear, meaning, you know, matrices of this kind. And now we looked at matrix that has zero on diagonal, had one here and minus, uh, you know, omega square here. So let's look at what we would naturally look at first. Which is, let's uh, look at the matrix that, for example, looks like this. X is, has a response to velocity only proportional with no contribution of Y. Y doesn't any cont get contribution from X, there is zero here. And you know, to make life a little bit simpler, I just use particular value for one of them, for example, minus one. Then this is, these are uncoupled equations. Like well, I'm, I'm multiplying, uh, you know, there is nothing here, nothing there, nothing here, nothing there. So these are two uncoupled equations. X dot equals A X Y dot equals minus Y. Now, if you know nothing about uh, integral calculus, but you I interested in money, so you have savings in the bank or investments, you will know how to solve this equation. Uh, all linear equations are essentially exponential, so their solutions are exponentials. So what will happen is this will be rate of change. Then, you know, there'll be some initial investment, there'll be x zero. And at time t, I'll have so much stuff or so little stuff depending on sign of this. And indeed, if I put this in the equation, you know, derivative puts an a down, the x zero cancels because it's a constant proportional to both velocity and the thing. So that is obvious. 
linear problems only have exponentials as solutions. And so these are two uncoupled equations. And now I can look what happens for different possible outcomes. So if A is negative, smaller than minus one, so not only negative, but even smaller than this rate, then I have a fixed point because in both directions I'm falling down. And you know, they are blind to each other because they're uncoupled. But you know, if I start with no x component, but the velocity component, I'll fall down at this rate. If I start with no velocity, but displacement, just that, I'll fall in. And uh, for other guys, I will have competition of falling very fast. So y is faster than x. So I'll be falling faster in this direction. So entire face plane is falling into the fixed point, And the flow looks like that, you know. Uh, it's stronger this way than that way because I have stronger contraction. So this is called a stable node. Stable fixed point. One of the popular names. Now, it turns out there is a special value of A, and that's A equals minus one. Then I'm falling at the same rate in the X and Y direction. And if you put it on your computer and you plot it, you will find out that no matter where I start, I just fall in at the same velocity, which is minus e to the minus one. So this is a very special solution, but it turns out you really want to pay attention to these very special solutions because they're kind of boundaries between different, qualitatively different behaviors. So here, I'm being squashed along the y-axis more, but here in this regime, uh, this dominates, minus one dominates over uh, A in this regime. So I find out the way this looks like is like this thing turned by 90 degrees, you know. I'm falling very fast here, slightly laggardly here, and everybody enters the fixed point. And then there's some special direction where I fall straight, but uh, that's what I get. Now, what's special about zero? Let's look at zero. So what happens uh, when, and again, you know, I need infinite precision to get into this situation, but conceptually it's very important because I, uh, so what happens at zero, and this is zero, then in X direction, you know, nothing's going on. I have a fixed point. But in Y direction, I'm still contracting with E to the minus Y, you know, this thing here. So if I start any place, I'll just fall down, not move in X direction, and end up on Y equals zero line. So I'll get a fixed point. Here it is. If I start someplace else, I'll fall down. If I start here, I fall down. If I start here, I fall down. If I start here, I fall down. So this is a weird situation, but it does happen. And it happens especially when you have symmetries. There isn't one fixed point, you know, like we have been used to here. There's actually a whole line of them. So entire x axis v0 
X is, is uh, marginal. This says words like neutral. Marginal. And then there is possibility that A is positive. This is positive, this is negative. So now we're in a situation, we have a fixed point. Here it is. We have what's called a stable manifold. So there are special trajectories. In this case, if I take X equals zero, Uh, where I just fall in, it's no Y component. But then if I take velocity zero as initial condition, but some non-zero, so I take a point on the horizontal line, I will find myself being expelled by, you know, unstable direction. And if I'm any place else, so these things have names, you'll see them very often. The thing that's falling into this point is called stable manifold. Manifold, because it tends to be curved. Right now it's straight, but that's exceptional situation. And this one dimensional curve here line is the unstable manifold. And if you start any place else, you have a thing about you're falling down in Y direction, but you're running away in A direction. So everybody else is running, it'll turn out on hyperbolas. Doesn't matter for us right now, but you know, nobody actually falls into this point. You might think you're falling into it, but the, when you get close enough, you start getting pushed out by the other unstable direction. And the whole floor is now described by the fixed point. It's stable and unstable manifolds because you are not allowed to cross these lines. And you have four quadrants in which you start by falling in, but you always get kicked out. So this particular node is called Settled node as opposed to stable node. Now, because we have fixed one of directions to be always contracting, this is all that we have. We have only one parameter. I told you always find a fixed point. Call it, let's say, x star. So this is a vector. In any dimension, we had it in one, now in two. Turns out you can do this in million dimensions or a few hundred thousand equally well. And now you have different kinds of fixed point. So we will use a little dot filled in for attracting. And there are other words like sync, we have seen it. If no matter where I start, as time evolves, so time goes to infinity, I always fall into that particular hole. In linear systems, that's all that can happen because it's only one fixed point. In general, we already saw this in one dimension. There could be several attracting points. So then you can't possibly have global attraction to one of them. They, each one of them would have what's called basin of attraction. Then there are you know, marginal cases that look like this. They're a little bit weird. So there are lines of things that are not moving, but everybody is falling in them. So that is called neutrally.
stable in the example I gave you, but it could be also unstable. That's okay. So it means in some directions you can decide what to do in other directions. Uh, or you can have point which is unstable. We'll denote this by a circle. And usually by this we mean that if we look at the infinitesimal neighborhood point, there are some directions in which I get pushed away by these exponentials. I call it unstable. If uh, I have the opposite situation to attracting, so attracting point, everybody falls in. I could have a situation where all directions are unstable. Then that's called repelling fixed point. You just can't get to it. No matter how you try, you get pushed away. So it's repelling, but uh, if there are some directions where you can approach it, other ones, you can escape it. That's in general. You know, more general notion of unstable point. Let's try to understand what happens to for linear system for any uh, matrix. And here is a thing that's, you know, maybe the most important thing that we're discussing tomorrow. And I spent, you know, much of the day wandering around and how to make it persuasive. You always thought that uh, this exists, but, you know, so wouldn't it be nice if there are some directions, you know, remember what we did in this uh, example, this diagonal example, you know, we designed an experiment where X and Y were uncoupled. And that enables us just to solve linear problems, one dimensional problems. Wouldn't it be nice if we could choose some kind of coordinates always in which uh, the whole matrix, so here is our matrix A. Right now it's four numbers, but in many dimensions, in D dimension is D square numbers. If it acted on a vector, so meaning just some direction away from the origin in the state space, and it just returned a number. So even though there was, you know, 500 numbers describing this matrix, if I measured it along this direction, uh, it acted just like a one-dimensional problem. So just like, you know, this one or that one across X and Y axis, but now this direction is more general, doesn't have to be in my lab coordinate system. One can rewrite this equation by putting lambda on the left-hand side, and you can write A minus that number times identity matrix, multiplying V, so this is just put that on the left-hand side, equals zero. Now that's a kind of strange thing. So there is a whole matrix, lots of numbers in here. I don't know what lambda is, but there should be some special value of lambda for which this happens. Uh, and it has a property that it crunches this particular direction into point, which means that, you know, if I had some volume in two, three, four, five dimensions, turns out there's a special direction in which the thickness of this volume is zero in that direction because, you know, as I apply this matrix, nothing happens. So I'm not moving in that particular direction. And that can only happen if the volume, a volume is computed as a determinant of a matrix. That's what volume is always in any dimension. In this case, it's an area, it's two dimensions. If determinant, 
were zero. Now, what's the determinant? Now, before I continue, this is so important that maybe Hegel himself, actually not Hegel because he was not a good mathematician, but German mathematicians gave it a name which makes perfect sense in German. So Eigen in German means own, my own, you know. So they call this Eigen vector And uh, they said, well, this value, and you'll see why is it my own, is eigen, my own value. And then what happened to German mathematician and physicist, uh, their population elected Hitler and thus destroyed both you know, all science in Germany for about 30, 40 years. And we would be giving this lecture in German, <laughs> otherwise, but uh, only remnant of this great civilization in our course is just this word Eigen. Thanks to lack of wisdom in the crowd. So, so let me just try this, you know, explicitly. So this was a matrix, it had four entries. So the entries were A, B, C, D, four numbers, this guy here. This is, this here is a minus. minus. And that's only on diagonal. So there is a minus lambda here and minus lambda here. And if, if this volume is not a full volume, but it has one or more dimensions squashed in it, then when I try to compute it, you know, in three dimension plane has a volume zero. So that's what we are doing. We're trying to find values of lambda for which this volume is not the volume, but the smaller dimensional thing. Uh, and the condition is that, well, volume equals zero. But when you work it out, multiplying on the diagonal, you get lambda square here. Then you get lambda times d and uh, minus, so you get minus. Uh, let me just emphasize that these are special things. So tau is a plus b. And that's called a trace of a matrix in English usage or spur in German. So we get quadratic term lambda, linear term in lambda, and then the remaining term is though lambda was zero, so that's just a determinant of what's there. Where determinant is A times D minus B times C determinant. So it turns out this thing will be zero only if this polynomial in lambda is zero. In other words, we have to find the roots of this polynomial we have to solve the quadratic equation. And notice that this quadratic equation doesn't depend on these four numbers. It only depends on two. One is called trace, one is called determinant. We'll come back to that because that's important. So now we have lambda square minus lambda plus equals zero. We have trace times delta. Now this is the equation that people have known how to solve for a very long time, just a quadratic equation. And this is now true for any two-dimensional 
matrix A. So four numbers are reduced to this equation, which depends on two numbers. And the solution is the usual solution of quadratic equation. You know, you get this coefficient here divided by two, and then you have to square it and take minus four determinant. And the other root is the same thing, but with minus. Now, okay, you know, that's quite a good question. <coughs> but, you know, this is really a big deal. Most important thing that happens today, I think. <laughs> this eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Because, you know, if this matrix is describing some, you know, some system, and in my lab, this system has coordinates X and Y, but in Tokyo, it has coordinates U and V turned at some other angle. We want to get the same result. You know, it shouldn't depend on my coordinates. And what that means is that in general, I demand from my science that we all agree no matter where we do our observations or measurements. So if my V is called this, your V might be some matrix linear transformation to make it simple of my thing, S for similarity transform. And then my original equation, this one here, you know, takes form, I multiply everybody from the left is my matrix, so I put here S A uh, on both sides, lambda, my vector multiplied by V. And now what I can do is I can stick an inverse transformation here and S, so these two guys equal to one. And now what I have is I have an equation for a different matrix and different vector giving me the same lambda. But to compute lambda, I need only the trace and the determinant. So let's say what happens to the trace. I take these combinations here as Now, trace has a cyclic property, so I can move one of these guys around, then it's times its inverse. So I get a trace does its same in all coordinates. What about determinant? Determinant of this matrix is now product of three matrices. But determinant of product of three matrix is a product of determinants, right? S minus one. So these two guys cancel and I get determinant A. So it turns out that the formula for eigenvalue is same every place. It's a big deal. You know, the reason why these eigenvectors, are eigenvalues are important, because they're invariant. And they're, you know, how I measure them, uh, where I measure them, et cetera. So the intrinsic property of the system. Now the eigenvectors, they're what's called equivariant. You know, if I go to a different system, of coordinates, eigenvector will get skewed in some way. 
but in a very clear, you know, relation to it. But eigenvalue is intrinsic, eigen, only one. And, you know, it might be plus and minus one. You ask, is this true? And you get answer plus or minus one. In a more sophisticated uh, kind of person, might get an answer lambda equals 42. So now, why is that a big deal? When we describe phenomena, we would like to agree with anybody. You know, for example, I told you in the zeroth lecture, I became physicist, so I could be able to speak to anybody on the globe and not be stuck in some stupid nationalist, you know, rabbit hole. And uh, there are some obvious things that everybody can agree on. So, you know, they're called topology. If my cat is dead in my coordinate system, or, you know, I have some process which results in a dead cat, that's called a fixed point. In St. John, you know, do the same thing in totally different context and language, the cat will be dead. So that's a topological property. You know, there is only one point in state space that describes the system. And depending who is mapping out the state space, you know, it's in imperial gallons or miles or meters or whatever, but it will be just one fixed point. Now is another, you know, very classical, very ancient idea that comes from Babylonians and probably earlier. If you have a periodic motion in state space, it means you run around and you come back periodic. Now, everybody who does the same thing in totally different contexts should get a periodic motion. And that's already something that's very typical of nonlinear physics. Now, there are other invariant objects like Torah, etc., where you know you run in some space, but that space is lower dimension than, than the whole state space. And again, topological idea is you and I are doing the same thing if we are caught in a topologically same kind of object. Now, what's amazing about the eigenvectors, they give us real information. You know, they tell us how quickly I run away. You've seen this in the examples I've given, how fast I fall in. So they give us real numbers. So they give us, you know, what's called metric information. It turns out that uh, if you look at Eigen, you can assign eigenvalues for each dimension of the problem. And these numbers are pure numbers. But basic idea is that, you know, I tell you, not only I have a periodic motion, or uh, I have quasi-periodic motion on, you know, torus in a state space, but it goes five times this way before it goes three times that way. That's what's happened in celestial mechanics, for example. And I'm transferring real information about the system, which is now how strongly, how weakly it does stuff. And we all agree on it because it doesn't depend on coordinates. So something you might not find very impressive. Now I'm telling you, but that's what I find incredible about linear theory, flat uh, world theory. It seems limited, but it's actually quite powerful even for nonlinear problems. So again, you know, how do you think about this eigen stuff? In my coordinates, you know, I have one centimeter up and one centimeter to the right. This is X, this is Y. And, uh, you know, these are my, my coordinate system, Cartesian coordinate system. And in this coordinate system, I can study a point which I call X. 
which can be written in Descartes' way as a sum of two components, you know, along x-axis and along y-axis. Now I'm given this matrix A, and that matrix has its own eigenvectors, and they look something like that. So there is eigenvector one, eigenvector two, and in my coordinate, they look a little bit messy because they're a mixture of everything I have. But uh, I can use that now to express my state in terms of new coordinates. So, you know, length C1 and length C2 in new coordinates. So my vector in my Euclidean coordinates, I can write it as a sum linear combination of the eigenvectors. And what's good about this is that this is eigen coordinate system, eigen coordinates. So now what happens is when I look at my equation, if I write it in, not in my Euclidean lab, my lab coordinates, but I write it in terms of these guys, this matrix along these coordinates has only one component. And if I take a time derivative of both sides, I'll get an equation for first component dot, second component dot, along, you know, this basis V1 plus V2. And now I have just one dimensional equation along this new coordinate, so I can write the answer. And in electrical engineering and in quantum mechanics, this is what you do all the time. You say, my solution is a sum of eigenstates or eigenvectors, whatever they were. And in this subspaces, one-dimensional subspaces, it behaves very simply, just exponential in the subspace. So what's beautiful about eigenvectors is that you can take a system here in two dimensions, but in any number of dimensions, and you can write it as a sum of one dimensional systems. And that becomes important when you start solving high dimensional problem because the original matrix here can have thousands and million components, but you need roughly speaking only a square root and often much more of one dimensional systems to understand how it will behave. So it's eigenmode. It's uh, example five, two. It's in the book, so just do it yourself. You know, you can just by hand do this uh, calculation, get eigenvalues, eigenvectors, uh, once you have that, you can solve initial condition problems. So you have a time equals zero, some state which you call x zero. Let's say in this particular example, it was two minus three in your lab coordinate, your Euclidean coordinate. Now you're supposed to write it in terms of eigenvectors. In the example, I didn't work out the eigenvectors, one points along the diagonal and other one kind of points, not orthogonal to it, but across it. And, you know, you look at this, this is cooked up to be incredibly easy. You immediately see that uh, if I take this equal one and this equal one, I'll you know, get 
what I have on the left hand side. So this is expressing things in the eigenbasis, negative four, essentially. You'll see I got confused because There are two eigenvalues, the one corresponding to this, and you know, I didn't do the calculation, but it's in the book, it's easy. It's minus two, and the other one is, that's why I got the three minus three, 1.4. And that's it, that's a solution of the problem, because in these new coordinates, you know, now I can go back to my old coordinates, and I get that x1, my Euclidean coordinates, x1t and x2t. You know, they just, what you see there, 2t plus e minus 3t. And if you're taking quantum mechanics course, you see this all the time, 4e minus 3. And, uh, you know, this is a growing exponential, so this is going to be dominant. And this is shrinking with time, so this is subdominant. And if you write it in, the, in terms of uh, eigen vectors of the problem, you will see that there is a direction in which everybody runs away. I think I have it the wrong way. Uh, everybody falls in this way, sorry. And everybody runs away that way in the unstable direction. This is unstable, this is stable. And if you start with this point, minus two, three, it's someplace here, and you'll discover that it, it you know, starts falling in and then goes out. And you have world divided in four kinds of things uh, where you run on a hyperbolic solutions. But for any initial point, you know how to solve this. So you have this nice face portrait and it helps you greatly. When we look at these formulas for eigenvalues, nobody tells you that this combination cannot be negative. You have a general matrix, anything can happen. So you can write uh, your eigenvalues, sometimes could be complex. You can write them like this, plus and minus where alpha is your trace and omega is, you know, square root of minus what used to be down there, so because you pulled an eye out here. And now uh, your solutions, this thing has a real part, which is, you know, whatever it is, and it has an imaginary part. Now, what do you do? You started with the real problem, who asks for imaginary numbers? Well, you go back to old Euler and his magical formula that says that, you know, every imaginary exponential can be thought of cosine plus i sine omega t, and just make sure that, you know, things add up for initial conditions so you get real numbers. And now you get a set of possible solutions depending on the signs of these guys. But it alpha is zero, so you don't run away or you're not being shrunk exponentially. You will find yourself running on circles, which is what we found when we looked at harmonic oscillators, you'll find periodic motion. If alpha is negative, you're shrinking, so you'll be falling in. These things are called in spirals.
in alpha is positive, you'll be pushed away while you are trying to run in a circle. So you'll be producing out spirals. Then there is e equal eigenvalues problem, which I will not do, but the two versions of it, one we already saw, it just keep falling out in all direction at same pace. But then there is a, we, there is a, if A equals zero, everybody is a fixed point because you know, nobody is being moved at all. So whole plane is fixed point. But then there is a special case where you bring it to the form which is off diagonal, and then you'll find only one eigenvector. That's described nicely by Stroh, that's how that works. And to summarize, in two dimensions, fixed points depend only on two numbers. One is the trace and the other one is determinant of your linear matrix. You know, trace is the sum of the eigenvalues. If you diagonalize the matrix, you'll have eigenvalues on it. And determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. There's a special case, there's a boundary case, which is a sideways parabola, which is defined by your discriminant, the thing that was in here, tau square equals minus four times the determinant equals zero. So that's a marginal case between being positive or imaginary. And uh, if you're on this side, so your delta is negative, it means one eigenvalue has a minus sign. And we know what happens there. That means I have a saddle point. So in this parameter plane of trace and determinant, everybody on this side is just a saddle point. Then down here, this is the case with trace called zero. We know that we run on ellipses in that case, so they're called centers. Then if tau is negative, I'm stable, and there are two kinds of stability. If it's very negative and I have a discriminant, which is, doesn't give me imaginary value, so I don't have oscillation, you know, I get stable, stable nodes. Inside, I'm oscillating, but shrinking, tau is negative, so I get stable or in spirals. If tau is positive, I'm being pushed away, so I get unstable or out spirals. And if I have a not imaginary discriminant, eigenvalues are all positive, then here I just have nodes which are unstable in all directions. So these guys are called unstable nodes. And that's all you need to know about stability of fixed points in two dimensions. There is oscillatory war, and the rest is either, you know, you are on a hole, or you're at the tip of the mountain, you have to run in all directions, or you're on the ridge in the mountains, that's called a settle point, and that's it, everything we need to know in two dimensions 
on the level of linear map. 